Iceman may be an iconic character, but at first, Val Kilmer hated playing him. The actor may seem to have it all when he's playing a part on the big screen, but the personal story of Val Kilmer has often been a tragic one. Val Kilmer and his two brothers, one older and one just a year younger, were raised by their parents together until Val was nine years old. Then, in 1968, the Kilmers divorced. Following the split, the three sons went to live with their father. Val never really got over the divorce. Despite living with his dad, Val described becoming distant from his father and at times generally despondent, telling the Telegraph, I was quiet, more contemplative than outgoing, and things didn't go well between me and my father for a very long time. When Kilmer's father passed away in the mid-1990s, he and his older brother Mark would end up clashing badly as they tried to settle their late father's affairs. Perhaps the only good that came of the divorce was that shortly after his parents separated, Val began to show an active interest in drama, taking classes perhaps as a way to use acting to escape the challenges of his real life. According to a 1999 interview while promoting the film At First Sight, Kilmer noted that his struggles with his art started at a very young age. The actor didn't land the first part he tried out for, but it wasn't because he was not up to the job. Instead, Kilmer didn't land the part because he just couldn't bring himself to commit to it. Kilmer, a noted method actor, said that he walked off the set of a hamburger commercial because he simply couldn't convince himself to believe in the burgers. As Kilmer noted in the interview, he found that if he didn't believe what his character was saying, he couldn't play the part. Of course, this was a hamburger commercial, and Val Kilmer was 12 years old at the time. But with a few years of drama classes already under his belt and a clear sense of himself as an actor, he just couldn't nail the performance. As a result, he failed to land the coveted role of the kid in the burger commercial. When Val Kilmer was just 17 years old, a truly terrible tragedy struck his family. His younger brother Wesley, who was 16 years old, died in a shocking accident. Wesley had epilepsy and happened to experience a seizing fit while he was in a swimming pool. The teenager died by drowning, leaving Val heartbroken. Though clearly a more major trauma than his parents' divorce eight years earlier, it was another example of loss in Val Kilmer's young life. Val managed to pull himself together, though, and that same year entered the esteemed drama program at the Juilliard School in New York City, becoming the youngest person ever accepted into the school at the time. He was still more than half a decade away from any meaningful success on the stage or the screen, but Val Kilmer was well on his way. Val Kilmer and actress Joanne Wally got to know each other and fell in love while working together on the Ron Howard-helmed action-adventure movie Willow, which came out in 1988. The pair married and had two children, a daughter named Mercedes and a son named Jack. However, their love story was not to be long-lived and would end quite badly. The pair divorced in 1996, and the split did not go well. Wally long suspected Kilmer of infidelity. And according to the British tabloid The Daily Mail, he reportedly was courting world-famous supermodel Cindy Crawford. Kilmer and Crawford did later have a public relationship for a time, as his marriage to Wally was falling apart. Kilmer would later say that part of what doomed the relationship with his ex-wife was his full commitment to the role of Jim Morrison in Oliver Stone's The Doors. Kilmer admitted to spending the better part of a year essentially acting as if he were the troubled rocker out of a devotion to method acting. What is wrong with being a large mammal? A big beast, like a tank. Wally had divorce papers served to Kilmer while he was on the set of The Island of Dr. Moreau. That film was directed by John Frankenheimer, one of many in Hollywood who would later claim he hated working with Kilmer. Frankenheimer would later tell the Orlando Sentinel, I will never climb Mount Everest, and I will never work with Val Kilmer again. There isn't enough money in the world. John Frankenheimer was not the only person who openly hated working with Val Kilmer, not by a long shot. In fact, Kilmer managed to develop a reputation as one of the worst actors to work with in the entire American film industry. In 1996, Entertainment Weekly published an article with the headline, Val Kilmer Makes Enemies in Hollywood, which included the line, Many in Hollywood are loath to work with Kilmer, no matter how big the box office payback. Remember that in 1996, Kilmer had already lit up screens in one of the finest crime thrillers of the modern era, Heat. He had also played one of the most famous characters of all time, Batman, in Batman Forever. And of course, he had been Iceman in the worldwide hit Top Gun. You can be my wingman anytime. 
Kilmer was still earning multiple millions of dollars, but his reputation for being difficult on set surely cost him plenty of opportunities. A sad irony is that it's possible that his interpersonal issues were caused by his efforts to go all out on any given project. By fully committing to his craft, it seems he wasn't able to be a decent person to the people around him off-screen. In the documentary Val, Kilmer acknowledged his own troubled past, saying, I have behaved poorly. I have behaved bravely, bizarrely to some. I see myself as a sensitive, intelligent human being, but with the soul of a clown. Although toned and taut as Iceman in 1986, by the late 2000s, Val Kilmer was middle-aged and quite overweight and the tabloids and papers took cruel notice. In 2007, the Daily Mail ran a juvenile and degrading headline that read, Val Kilmer goes from Batman to Fat Man. Kilmer would start to turn his physical health around a few years later, apparently beginning to take long walks on the beach near his Malibu, California home and adopting a healthier diet. By the middle of the next decade, his weight loss efforts had seemingly been a success. But of course, many in the media couldn't resist adding subtle barbs from the other end of the spectrum. So the new slimmer Kilmer was often described in very different but also unflattering terms. For instance, in December of 2014, the Daily Mail ran another insulting headline that read, Gaunt Val Kilmer reveals dramatically shrinking frame while shopping at Levi's in Malibu. Harsh words about a 55-year-old man who had managed to slim back down to a healthy weight. Obviously, relationships ending was never really anything new for Val Kilmer, starting back with his parents splitting up before he was even in middle school. And then there was the relationship he had with Cher in the 1980s. She was 13 years his senior and already a world-famous star, while he was just starting his ascent to fame. Kilmer would say of Cher in his memoir, I'm your Huckleberry, once Cher works her way inside your head and heart, she never leaves. For her true friends, her steadfast love and loyalty never die. One very notable breakup was with Val Kilmer's ex-wife and mother of his children, Joanne Wally. But the actor described his most painful breakup ever as the end of a brief relationship with actress Daryl Hannah. The pair became close while working on the film Hard Cash and would spend quite a bit of time alone in intimate privacy at his New Mexico property. In his book, I'm Your Huckleberry, Kilmer would write this about Hannah. Lord knows I've suffered heartache, but Daryl was by far the most painful of all. Neil Young, I always loved you, but I'm afraid I hate you now. Why did Kilmer reference Neil Young? Well, in 2018, Hannah married the legendary singer. It's now very public knowledge that Val Kilmer fought off nearly fatal throat cancer and in the process forever lost his voice. Kilmer's voice was one of the aspects of him that was so recognizable and even iconic, not to mention indispensable for roles like Jim Morrison in The Doors. For several years, however, Kilmer kept his battle with cancer private. In 2017, however, Kilmer finally publicly admitted that he had fought and beaten cancer, first revealing it with a rather arcane choice of words used during a Reddit AMA with fans in which he said he did have a healing of cancer. That healing of cancer was actually two tracheotomies and chemotherapy that the actor endured over the course of about two years starting in 2015. That is seriously invasive, taxing stuff, and it speaks to the severity of the cancer Kilmer had to overcome. And in fact, even as recently as the summer of 2021, the actor described himself as still recovering. It's hard to imagine one of the biggest Hollywood stars of the past four decades as feeling lonely. Val Kilmer is a man who has had relationships with some of the most famous women of our day, who has worked with the biggest stars on the planet, and who has generally been in the public spotlight for most of his life. Yet, in his book, I'm Your Huckleberry, Kilmer writes, I am lonely part of every day. He writes that he has not had a girlfriend in two decades, which has only exacerbated his loneliness. It also means he faced his cancer battle without a close romantic companion. Fortunately for Kilmer, it does seem that in those years he managed to develop a closer relationship with his children who were instrumental in helping with the creation of the documentary Val. Val Kilmer became Jim Morrison. His acting was pitch perfect, and he embodied the ill-fated frontman to a T. And Kilmer loved working on the movie Heat, saying during a Reddit AMA session, well, imagine being able to say, Al and Bob for the rest of your life. Not many people can do that. Priceless experience. Watching all the actors do their thing. Loved every minute of it. But Batman Forever? Kilmer said he hated working on the film. 
describing himself as feeling like a puppet in a bat costume, according to the Daily Mail. And Kilmer initially hated the role of Iceman in Top Gun, writing in his memoir that he felt the script was silly. He even tried to botch his audition, adding, I read the lines indifferently, and yet, amazingly, I was told I had the part. I felt more deflated than inflated. In 2021, the unique documentary Val was released by Amazon Studios. The film's description reads, Val Kilmer, one of Hollywood's most mercurial actors, has been documenting his life and craft through film. This raw and wildly original documentary reveals a life lived to extremes and a heart-filled look at what it means to be an artist. The film is an amalgamation of private footage and public footage over which the actor speaks about his life. Or at least it sounds that way, given the first-person use of language and the fact that the voice sounds just like Val Kilmer. But in fact, the person speaking is Kilmer's son, Jack. Since the elder Kilmer's voice was lost to cancer, Jack and his sister, Mercedes, were instrumental in the production of Val. Having helped sort through some 800 hours of footage their dad had available, Jack and Mercedes also appear prominently in the documentary and did a lot to promote the film that celebrated the life and legacy of their famous dad. Even if you don't know his name, chances are you know one iconic role played by John Matuzak. No matter how tragic Sloth's life was at the hands of the Fratelli family though, it doesn't come close to the wild ups and downs of John Matuzak's real life. Beneath the prosthetics, Matuzak spent years struggling with drugs and wildly reckless behaviour that led to his untimely death at the age of 38. Here's Sloth's tragic real life story. Drugs, booze and football. Before he ever set foot in front of a camera, John Matuzak was known first and foremost as a football player. The Houston Oilers made Matuzak the number one overall draft pick in 1973, and rightfully so. He measured in at 6 foot 8 and 280 pounds. In fact, the only thing in the locker room bigger than Matuzak was his drug habit. In 1970 slang, football players with a heavy amphetamine habit were called 747s because of how high they were flying. Matuzak, well, they jokingly called him John Glenn, as in the astronaut. But the drugs couldn't keep the twos floating forever. He was let go by the Houston Oilers, then dropped by the Kansas City Chiefs after coach Paul Wigan found him unconscious from an overdose of whiskey and pills. He then wound up on the Washington Redskins, but coach George Allen gave him the boot over concerns of his diet of vodka and Valium. One for me. Oops, breakfast for champions there. Rings and handcuffs. After the Redskins, Matuzak wound up with the Oakland Raiders. The joke at the time was that he didn't have to be a convicted felon to play for the Raiders, but it helped. And Matuzak fit right in with the infamous beefed up leatherheads of the late 70s Raiders. He was a key player in two Super Bowl wins for the team, first in 1977 and then in 1981. But even that kind of success didn't stop his drug-fueled antics, like the time he was arrested for driving drunk and firing a gun at street signs. A few nights before his second Super Bowl win, he earned a $1,000 fine for partying. But considering the team as a whole racked up a legendary $15,000 in fines before that Super Bowl win, it isn't hard to argue that he had found a home for himself of sorts on that team world's strongest man. During some off-season time, Matuzak entered the 1978 World's Strongest Man competition because he was bored like you do. By then, he'd beefed up to 315 pounds, and while he didn't win at all, he did place ninth. That's already pretty impressive, but even more so because, according to his Oakland Raiders teammates, he never actually trained specifically for the contest. He just used his natural brawn to do things like bend an iron bar around his neck. That's pretty intense. Image problems. After retiring from football, Matuzak opened up to discuss more intimate parts of himself to try and separate himself from the persona he created as an utterly terrifying defensive lineman. In interviews gathered by UPI in 1982, he discussed the differences between his monstrous public persona and the man he actually was in his personal life. He played Santa Claus and taught football to kids at summer camp. He regularly visited his sister in the hospital when she was struggling with cystic fibrosis, which two of his brothers died from. Few of those stories made the press, however. People just wanted to hear about him getting drunk and rowdy. It was the legacy he lived with. Painkillers. 
Being a maniac on the field makes some good press and intimidates the competition, but it's disastrous on the human body. After retirement, Matuzak struggled with his physical pain that led to a full-blown painkiller addiction after his football career. He would struggle with that addiction for the half dozen or so years he lived post-retirement. In all likelihood, his short but intense football career ate him alive. Acting Heavyweight Considering his short acting career, Matuzak appeared in a lot of films that either did well at the time or developed cult status. He starred in North Dallas 40, which is still considered one of the best football movies ever made. He of course has The Goonies under his belt, a film where he was genuinely loved by everyone involved. He also appeared in Ringo Starr's film Caveman and had a part in the cult classic sci-fi comedy Ice Pirates. One of his longest recurring roles was on Aaron Spelling's short-lived Hollywood Beat, where he played a gay bar manager called George Grinsky. Playing a gay character with sensitivity in the Reagan years was a pretty gutsy move, and critics at the time skewered him for it, saying he was the latest casualty of a sensitive sensitivity epidemic. It really seems like nobody at the time would just let him try to succeed in anything that didn't involve him brutalizing people. Traffic Assault Even in the midst of the most success he'd ever experienced, Matuzak struggled with the crisis of identity. Also, drugs. He was still on a lot of drugs. A couple of years before he died, Matuzak got in a car wreck and punched the other driver unconscious before fleeing the scene. Considering the work he was involved with at the time was the action flick One Man Force and the cop drama Miami Vice. You have to wonder if there was some overlap between reality and fantasy at that point. He was delving back into his reckless ways even as he was finally being recognized for the talented, sensitive man he wanted to show the world. Love, love, Jack. A tragic end. Throughout his life, John Matuzak never hesitated to dive headfirst into any challenge, but he appeared to have his life under control in the late 80s, when he wrote in his 1987 autobiography, Cruisin' with the Twos. I abstain from cocaine and any other foreign substance entirely now. I take nothing, not even sleeping pills. I've hit damn near bottom. I don't ever want to go back. Nevertheless, Matuzak passed away in 1989 at the far too early age of 38 from an accidental overdose of Darvon, a prescription painkiller. Part of what contributed to his death was an enlarged heart, too big for even his giant body. It was the heart so many people came to love. From a troubled upbringing to a controversy at the Oscars, America's dad has been through some serious difficulties in his life. These are the heartbreaking details about Tom Hanks. As a kid, Tom Hanks was not a stranger to divorces and failed relationships. After all, his parents had seven between them. Hanks himself was five years old when his parents divorced. They both went on to remarry several times. His dad remarried three times before he found his true match, and his mother remarried four times before she found hers. In an emotional interview with BBC4's Desert Island Discs, Hanks lamented the lack of communication between his parents and his siblings to reassure them that they were not at fault. What's more? Hanks was constantly on the move as a child, living in 10 different houses in five years. Unsurprisingly, Tom Hanks wanted the kind of stability he didn't have as a child. As an adult, he now had the means to establish it, and so he married young. He was 23 years old when he tied the knot with college sweetheart and actress Samantha Luz. At the time, Tom's firstborn son, Colin, was two years old. In an interview with The Express, Hanks recalled his first marriage with some regret since he now knows he wasn't ready. He and Luz met at Sacramento State University as acting students. When they later separated, he was aware that he was placing his two children in the same situation he once was in as a kid. Hanks' first marriage had no chance of surviving when he met Rita Wilson in the midst of it. When he first lay eyes on Wilson, he was smitten. They officially met on the set of Bosom Buddies in 1981, and then they worked together again on Volunteers in 1984. It was that second collaboration that became the point of no return. The two began dating publicly in 1986, and Hanks' divorce from Luz was finalized in 1987. Although Tom Hanks divorced Samantha Luz in 1987, she was still the mother of two of his children. So, the news of her bone cancer diagnosis in 2001 must have been devastating. He learned of it during Oscar season, when he was nominated for Best Actor for Castaway, per the New York Post. Luz died in 2002. The people who felt her loss the most were likely her children. 
Colin Hanks spent most of his time with his mother growing up, only seeing his dad every other weekend and during summer vacation. The differences between the two homes were drastic. In an interview with the podcast, The Armchair Expert, Colin said he wasn't sure how much his mother was getting in alimony, but he would often hear her say that they didn't have the amount of money Tom did. Colin also said his father's wealth was limited until he starred in Forrest Gump, which occurred when Colin was already 17 years old. As one of America's most successful stars, you'd assume that Tom Hanks must have had an easy transition to the director's chair. In fact, for his directorial debut, That Thing You Do, he received help from the great Nora Ephron, who advised him to trim down his characters and his scenes. Hank's movie about a one-hit wonder band set in the 1960s was inspired by the story of Jimmy Nichols' last-minute replacement of Ringo Starr during a Beatles tour. He began fiddling with the story while filming Forrest Gump and began developing it after wrapping up Apollo 13. But when the film hit theaters, it landed with a dud. It earned only $25 million in the United States and $8.7 million internationally. In an interview with The Ringer, Hanks said he was dismayed by its outcome. But the movie was liked by critics and it found a second life thanks to cable airings and a home video release. That Thing You Do eventually became a classic among a younger generation who saw it on DVD. Stars of the film still get recognized on the streets by fans, and Tom Everett Scott, who played drummer Guy Patterson, was given a cameo in La La Land thanks to his role. The director, Damien Giselle, considered himself the movie's biggest fan. Audiences may not have initially shown up for That Thing You Do, but film critics definitely did. But for Tom Hanks' second directorial feat, he received love from neither. The film in question, Larry Crown, is about a likable guy who is fired from his retail job because he doesn't have a college education. He starts taking classes at a community college and eventually falls in love with one of his professors. Audiences weren't enamored by the film, and it received a Rotten Tomatoes audience score of 41%. Critics were even more harsh. The Wall Street Journal called it a distinctly painful experience. The Los Angeles Times found the movie especially disappointing considering that another typical box office draw, Julia Roberts, co-starred with Hanks. Roger Ebert said Larry Crown had no reason for existing. As harsh as it was, perhaps Hanks should have considered himself lucky that Ebert wasn't as harsh as he could be. Clearly this movie is a total disappointment. No thought went into it, no effort went into it. In 2015, Tom Hanks' wife, Rita Wilson, announced that she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She underwent a double mastectomy and reconstructive surgery and took leave from the Broadway play Fish in the Dark. Wilson had a full recovery, which she credited to an early detection. In a statement to People magazine, Wilson advocated for second opinions and stressed the importance of an early diagnosis. She noted that Hanks, along with other friends and family, was supportive and was by her side during her recovery. By 2020, she had been cancer-free for five years. In an interview with Healthline, Wilson said she came to peace with her double mastectomy and is grateful for reconstruction. In 2013, Tom Hanks announced on The Late Show with David Letterman that he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. After battling with high blood sugar since he was 36 years old, his doctor told him he had, quote, graduated into diabetes. Tom Hanks said it was manageable through diet, and his doctor even told him he could reverse his condition if he lost weight and reached the same weight he had in high school. Any chance of that? What, what did you weigh in high school? I weighed 96 pounds in high school. <laughs> <laughs> and, um... Hanks believes that losing and gaining weight for roles might have led to his diagnosis, but he believes he was also genetically inclined to get it. He also blames the lifestyle and eating habits he's kept since he was a kid. In a very public news cycle, Tom Hanks and wife Rita Wilson were among the first celebrities to become publicly infected with COVID-19. He announced the news on March 11, 2020 on his Instagram, informing his followers of the protocol they adhered to. His listed symptoms included body aches, exhaustion, and a fever. They caught COVID-19 while Hanks was working on Baz Luhrmann's Elvis in Australia. A few days later, production on the film was postponed. Hanks and Wilson weren't sure how they got infected, but doctors assume both received it from the same persons. Hanks said that since social distancing hadn't caught on yet, he had been shaking hands and hugging numerous people. Their symptoms were so severe that they could have been hospitalized, but they weren't aware of how worrisome the news seemed to the rest of the world. 
Hanks and Wilson have said that they were mostly offline while trying to get better. On Twitter, Hanks said that he and his wife felt better after two weeks and were soon spotted back in Los Angeles. Whereas Tom Hanks' wholesome, nice guy persona has earned him the title of America's Dad, his son Chet Hanks' image hasn't been so clean. Chet's been involved in a few controversies, including an Instagram post denouncing the COVID-19 vaccine. But his troubled life goes beyond social media comments and into the realm of substance abuse. In 2015, Chet released a series of videos on Instagram explaining his whereabouts after an absence online. He had undergone treatment at a rehab center, revealing that he previously sold and used cocaine. But he since found himself in a better place and opened up on the lifelong pressures he struggled with. Seeing a child struggle with addiction and drug abuse is harrowing for any parent, and it's no different for Tom Hanks. Tom praised his son for his openness and honesty and said that he loves his children unconditionally. Chet said becoming a father forced him to recover, and he credited his own parents' support during the process. We all know Forrest Gump, Apollo 13, and Saving Private Ryan, but have you heard of The Bonfire of the Vanities and A Hologram for the King? Although Tom Hanks has starred in various hits that have likely been preserved and sanctified by the Library of Congress, he's had his share of misfires. The Bonfire of the Vanities is one of Hanks' most notorious failures, making only $15 million against a $47 million budget. Its failures were even detailed in a best-selling book called The Devil's Candy. Another bomb, Cloud Atlas, seemed sure to be a hit, considering that the filmmakers behind The Matrix were helming it. But it only garnered $130 million worldwide, with only $27 million of that being domestic against a whopping $150 million budget. Hanks has said that he's experienced periods of despondency as a result of failed features. Filming Cloud Atlas was life-changing for him, and it was the only film of his he's seen more than once, so he had high hopes. But failure comes with the territory. He believes that 80% of an actor's films end up being financial failures. But Hanks, whose net worth is an estimated $400 million, can afford to make a couple duds here and there. So it's not all doom and gloom. As tomorrow the sun will rise. Who knows what the tide could bring? Even as successful as Tom Hanks is, he doesn't put himself or his work on a pedestal. His highest-earning franchise is no exception. The Da Vinci Code series was mightily successful at the box office. Its first installment garnered $760 million in revenue worldwide, making it Hank's most financially successful film. In an interview with the New York Times, he defended himself against accusations of cynicism which argued that he only acted in its sequels for money. Although he called the series a commercial enterprise, he believed the series sought to entertain people with pure motives. However, he also called the movies hooey, comparing their accuracy to the espionage and James Bond movies. By the end of the franchise, Hanks believed it was no longer, quote, good commerce. In 2002, Hanks said that he didn't believe any of his movies were underrated and all received at least their deserved praise. In an interview with The Guardian, Hanks admitted that he's made movies that didn't make a lot of sense, but they all required effort. Even then, he doesn't like to think about his past roles because they remind him of individual acting decisions he regrets making. When Forrest Gump won Best Picture at the 1995 Oscars, it was immediately controversial. Not because it didn't deserve the win on its own terms, in fact, the movie presented an impressive feat of digital filmmaking that allowed Forrest to interact with dead figures in old footage. Rather, it was controversial because it won over Pulp Fiction. Quentin Tarantino's cult film set in motion a wave of indie filmmaking, and his stylistic directing and sleek dialogue was perceived as a breath of fresh air for cinema. Since then, people are quick to crown Pulp Fiction as the true winner and Forrest Gump, despite its cultural weight, as the upset. And? And, no and nothing. That's it. But Tom Hanks wants none of it. Although he admits that Forrest Gump relied on baby boomer nostalgia and calls Pulp Fiction a masterpiece, he believes that his movie has an undeniable heartbreaking humanity that makes it worthy of its Oscar. 
In an interview with the New York Times, Hanks said he believes the movie's immediate financial success dampened its legacy since it's never on any lists for the best movies of all time. Brandon Lee was on the verge of establishing his identity as an actor outside the shadow of his legendary father when he was suddenly killed in an accident on the set of The Crow. This is his tragic true life story. Brandon Lee was born on February 1, 1965 in Oakland, California, the eldest of martial artist and actor Bruce Lee's two children. He was very close to his father, and the two had a playful relationship throughout Brandon's early childhood. In 1986, Brandon told Black Belt magazine that he and his dad used to goof around a lot together. Nevertheless, the serious business of fitness and martial arts was always on his father's mind. As Brandon told Black Belt, we worked out together and he would show me things. He was always training. I started training with my dad really as soon as I could walk. I mean, my dad was a really diligent trainer. Sadly, father and son never got the opportunity to get serious about martial arts together. As Brandon recalled, My dad and I used to talk about martial arts sometimes, and I remember thinking, I'll get a little older and dad will quit working quite so much and he'll have more time. I always assumed there would be a time when we began training more formally. Unfortunately, we never got to do that. Bruce Lee was only 32 when he died of a swelling of the brain on July 20, 1973. Following his father's passing, eight-year-old Brandon moved to Seattle with his mother and sister. Growing up the child of the most famous martial artist of all time took an emotional toll on Brandon Lee. He spent much of his early childhood facing down schoolyard bullies anxious to get the best of Bruce Lee's son and his teen years were even more tumultuous. However, his adversaries were no longer wannabe tough guys. Authority itself became his number one enemy. He was kicked out of two high schools, and he told People magazine in 1992, I always had a pretty good knack for raising hell. According to Jim Spaulding, Lee's former chemistry teacher at Chadwick School in Palos Verdes, California, he didn't need school, and he thumbed his nose at the rules. The charismatic Lee organized protests against the school administration, convincing his fellow students not to attend class. He would find himself expelled from the school for misbehavior and insubordination in the spring of 1983, only a few months short of graduation. Among his most notorious high school antics, and the last straw for the faculty, was driving his car in reverse through oncoming traffic through campus. Lee's penchant for hell-raising would eventually abate as he matured. Nevertheless, he still had a wild side. His close friend and fellow actor Lou Diamond Phillips described him as a, quote, boiling mass of energy. Despite his rebellious ways and frequent clashes with authority, Lee was an intelligent student with an aptitude for English and writing. According to his sister Shannon, he was a voracious reader who constantly carried a dictionary in case he encountered a word he didn't know. Most impressively, he even got a perfect score on the English section of the SAT. However, his language skills and love of books weren't enough to keep him within the confines of a typical curriculum. He was expelled from two high schools because of discipline issues, and he would go on to drop out of a third. Still, he understood the value of a diploma and pursued a GED. Soon after, he left California to attend Emerson College in Boston, but he spent most of his time going to New York City to pursue his dream of becoming a serious dramatic actor. He ultimately dropped out of Emerson after a year and returned to Los Angeles. Brandon Lee has had a keen awareness of his status as the son of Bruce Lee, and he struggled with it to varying degrees throughout his life. As a budding actor, he knew the potential consequences of being the son of a celebrity, so he contemplated keeping his parentage secret. He once wrote, I think that I could share the fact that I'm Bruce Lee's son with someone else. It's a fact that is both a burden and a blessing. Which one it is will be determined in years to come when I intend to share it with the whole world. Despite his obvious love and admiration for his dad, his relationship with the legend of Bruce Lee inspired ambivalence and often suspicion. When asked about living in his father's shadow, Brandon told Black Belt magazine, It used to be a real problem in my own head when I was younger. I would be thinking, does this person like me, or is this person just screwing with me because I'm Bruce Lee's son? Following in his father's footsteps was the last thing on Brandon's mind, even though he ultimately did become an action star. Acting, not martial arts, was his main focus. Searching for his own identity, he avoided martial arts training for a time, putting all of his energy into becoming a serious dramatic actor. Nevertheless, his family name seemed to close more doors than it opened, at least when it came to the kind of roles that he wanted. Lee made his acting debut in the 1986 made-for-TV film Kung Fu the Movie, which was based on the 70s TV series of the same name. 
The show starred David Carradine in the lead role, though Lee's father had also been considered for the part. In 1987, Brandon Lee would find himself once again involved in a kung fu follow-up. This time, it was a pilot called Kung Fu The Next Generation, in which he starred as young troublemaker Johnny Kane, the great-great-grandson of the original show's protagonist. Unfortunately, the pilot turned out to be an unqualified misfire. With a nonsensical plot involving arms dealers, Kung Fu The Next Generation failed to generate network or audience interest. It only aired once as a part of CBS Summer Playhouse, a showcase for unsold pilots that invited viewers to call in to decide the show's fate. This would ultimately be Lee's last major foray into TV. Welcome to the family business. Like his father, Brandon Lee first found professional success in Hong Kong. His film debut was 1986's Legacy of Rage, in which he plays squeaky clean Brandon Ma, an average guy who's framed for homicide by his drug dealer friend Michael. Following eight brutal years in prison, Brandon takes bloody revenge on his duplicitous pal and his gang. Packed with gunfights, car chases, and a simple good guys versus bad guys plot, Legacy of Rage was a hit with Asian audiences. It even earned Lee a nomination for Best New Performer at the Hong Kong Film Awards. Despite its international success, though, the film wouldn't be released in the United States until 1998, five years after Lee's death. Lee's next leading film role was the 1989 low-budget action flick Laser Mission. Cast opposite an aging Ernest Borgnine, Lee stars as a mercenary who's tasked with rescuing a scientist from the KGB. Originally released under the title Soldier of Fortune, this film came out straight to video in 1990. Although it turned a profit, it was critically panned and regularly turns up on lists of great bad movies. Lee followed up Laser Mission with the somewhat more successful Showdown in Little Tokyo with Dolph Lundgren and a breakout starring role in the action film Rapid Fire. According to former Marvel CEO Margaret Lesh, Stan Lee wanted the actor to star as a live-action incarnation of Shang-Chi in either a film or a TV show. Shang-Chi first appeared in the comic book series Special Marvel Edition in 1973. He was created by Jim Starlin and Steve Englehart in response to the kung fu craze of the early 70s following Marvel's failed attempt to attain the rights to the TV show Kung Fu. Conceived as the son of the villainous Dr. Fu Manchu, Cheng Chi rebels against his father's evil ways to become a hero. According to Lesh, Stan Lee had a particular affinity for Shang Chi. She told Inverse, Stan did believe in the character. He used that as an example of the comic that could transition into the movie and television world. Brandon Lee caught the iconic comic mogul's eye in the late 80s, so Stan called Brandon and his mother in for a meeting to discuss potential Marvel characters that the young actor could play. As Lesh recounted to Inverse, Stan had great hope for Brandon. He thought Brandon would be a future star. Alas, the Shang-Chi project never came to fruition. Brandon Lee was offered the chance to play his father in the 1993 biopic Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, but he turned it down, citing discomfort with the material. In an interview on the British series The Little Picture Show, he explained his trepidation. I was a little scared by the whole thing, really. It's, it's strange to play your own father, you know. Career concerns and time also played a part in Lee's decision. As he noted, It's funny too, because to tell you the truth, if it had come along later in my career, I might have more seriously considered it. But as it is, it's so early in my career. It's the kind of thing I just feel like it could be a career ender. So the role would ultimately go to Jason Scott Lee, no relation, who noted that advice from Brandon Lee was integral to his success in the role. As he told the New York Times in 1993, Brandon said something that was very simple. He said, I wouldn't survive in this part if I treated his father like a god. He said his father was, after all, a man who had a profound destiny, but he was not a god. The film was dedicated to Brandon Lee, as it was released less than a month after the accident that took his life. The greatest tragedy about the accident that killed Brandon Lee on the set of The Crow is that it could have been avoided. The scene seemed simple compared to many of the film's other action sequences. Actor Michael Massey was supposed to fire a round from a 44 caliber revolver loaded with blanks. Lee, who was holding a grocery bag outfitted with a small explosive charge, was to react to the simulated bullet and fall. Initially, it seemed that Lee and Massey had nailed it all perfectly, but then Lee didn't get up. The actor was bleeding from a silver dollar-sized wound in his abdomen as he was rushed to the New Hanover Regional Medical Center in Wilmington, North Carolina. He underwent five hours of surgery to repair the damage that he'd suffered. Surgeons discovered what appeared to be a 44 caliber slug lodged in his spine, 
Despite the doctor's best efforts, Lee passed away on March 31, 1993 from massive blood loss. Somehow, a dummy slug used to make the prop weapon appear loaded for a close-up in a prior scene had gotten lodged in the barrel, creating the equivalent of a real bullet. Unfortunately, weapon specialist J.B. Jones had been sent home prior to shooting the scene, and no one else had thought to check the weapon. In 2005, Massey spoke with Extra about the accident. Since then, I am very conscious of the dangers of making a movie, and, and it is a dangerous proposition. At the time of his death, Lee was engaged to his longtime girlfriend, Eliza Hutton. Their wedding was scheduled for April 17, 1993, just over two weeks after Lee's death. His headstone would serve as a tribute to the couple's love. Etched into the black granite monument are the words, For Brandon and Eliza, ever joined in true love's beauty. That's followed by a passage from the 1949 novel The Sheltering Sky that Lee quoted in one of his final interviews. Because we do not know when we will die, we get to think of life as an inexhaustible well, and yet everything happens only a certain number of times. How many more times will you remember a certain afternoon of your childhood that is so deeply a part of your being, you can't even conceive of your life without it? Perhaps four or five times more? Perhaps not even that. How many more times will you watch the full moon rise? Perhaps 20? And yet, it all seems limitless. Carrie Fisher lived an incredibly unique life. She was the daughter of celebrities who gained iconic fame herself in one of the most beloved movies of all time. But behind Princess Leia was a tragic story of drug addiction, bipolar disorder, and sour relationships. Fisher was famous before she was even born. Her parents, Eddie Fisher and Debbie Reynolds, were both singers and actors themselves who were christened America's sweethearts. Carrie joked in her book Wishful Drinking that when she was born, the doctors ignored her because they were too busy fawning over her parents. But in 1958, when Carrie was just two years old, the golden couple rocked America when Eddie left his wife for Elizabeth Taylor. Taylor and Reynolds had been friends since they were teenagers, and Eddie was even the best man at Taylor's 1957 wedding to his friend Mike Todd. When Todd died in a plane crash in 1958, the grieving Taylor and Fisher started an affair. Fisher and Reynolds divorced in 1959, and then he and Taylor married that same year. But that union didn't last very long either, as they divorced in 1964. Carrie and her younger brother Todd lived with their mother while growing up. They had a glamorous childhood in which they met several members of the Hollywood A-list. Carrie later wrote that she and her brother missed spending time with their mother, who loved being with her children but also worked a lot. The chemistry between Princess Leia and Han Solo was undeniable in the original Star Wars trilogy, and behind the scenes, it was pretty intense as well. In her 2016 memoir, The Princess Diarist, Fisher revealed that she and Harrison Ford, who was married at the time, had an affair in 1976 during the filming of the first Star Wars movie. It started at a birthday party for director George Lucas, when Ford rescued her from a group of crew members who had gotten the 19-year-old Fisher drunk. But then Ford, who was 33 at the time, took advantage of the situation himself. He took her into a taxi where they made out, and then they started an affair that lasted for the rest of the shoot. It was a three-month, one-night stand. Fisher also admitted in the book that she wanted to have an affair because she felt like it would make her seem like an adult. But looking back, she saw that she was naive and insecure. Nevertheless, she developed deeper feelings for Ford, who was emotionally aloof by her account. During her life, Fisher was a proud advocate for people with mental health issues. She herself was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when she was 24, although it took her five years to accept the diagnosis. In her 2008 memoir, Wishful Drinking, she described bipolar disorder as having a mood system that functions essentially like weather. Her bipolar usually manifested in mania, although depression became more common as she got older, especially agitated depression, which she described in an interview with WebMD by saying, I was going much faster than everything else around me and it drove me crazy. You feel out of step with the world. Fisher's characteristic unflinching honesty and humor about her bipolar made her a champion for people who shared her diagnosis. In an advice column for The Guardian published in November 2016, she wrote to a reader asking for advice on coming to terms with mental illness by saying, We have been given a challenging illness and there is no other option than to meet those challenges. Think of it as an opportunity to be heroic. Move through those feelings and meet me on the other side. As your bipolar sister, I'll be watching. Fisher was also famously candid about using drugs and alcohol to cope with the emotional ups and downs that came with her bipolar disorder. She started smoking weed when she was 13, although she quit the drug six years later on the set of Star Wars. But then during production of the first sequel, The Empire Strikes Back, she did cocaine a couple of times. Ultimately, her drug use turned into a full-blown addiction to various substances, including cocaine, hallucinogens, and opiates. 
In Wishful Drinking, Fisher explained how drugs temporarily soothed but ultimately exacerbated the impact of her bipolar. As she put it, I used to refer to my drug use as putting the monster in the box. I wanted to be less, so I took more. It wasn't until she overdosed in 1985 and went into rehab that she was able to confront both her addictions and her bipolar. Getting off drugs with the help of Alcoholics Anonymous meetings initially made her feel crazy. She also occasionally relapsed, and getting sober remained a struggle for her. Fisher was introduced to musician Paul Simon by actor Richard Dreyfuss in January 1978. On one early date, they ended up dancing at the famous New York nightclub Studio 54. She soon moved into Simon's apartment near Manhattan's Central Park, and they started an intense romance that lasted 12 non-consecutive years. As Fisher wrote in Wishful Drinking, Paul and I had the secret handshake of shared sensibility. We understood each other perfectly. Despite their connection, the relationship wasn't without its problems. Simon struggled to cope with Fisher's mania and depression that were exacerbated by her drug use. They split up in June 1983, but soon enough, they were back together, and that September, they got married. The marriage only lasted 11 months, but after a year apart, they started dating again. What finally ended the relationship permanently wasn't their fighting or Fisher's erratic behavior. According to Simon biographer Peter Ames Carlin, while the couple was traveling in the Amazon, they took a powerful hallucinogen, and Fisher had a vision of being pinned down by Simon's brain. They split for good in 1990. During one of her off periods with Paul Simon, Fisher squeezed in another serious romance. In late 1977, when she was 21, she started hanging around with the Saturday Night Live cast members and writers, inviting them to her wildly popular parties in her New York apartment. She became good friends with John Belushi, bonding over a shared sense of humor and cocaine. On November 18, 1978, Fisher hosted an SNL episode that featured Belushi and Dan Aykroyd as the Blues Brothers, and the following July, she joined them for the Blues Brothers movie, which came out in 1980. Aykroyd had just split from his girlfriend, and Fisher was fighting with Simon. Belushi reportedly encouraged them to get together. At first, it was just a fling. Fisher appreciated Aykroyd's sweet nature, and he wanted to save her. After he literally saved her from choking on a Brussels sprout, the romance got serious. They even got engaged, with Aykroyd proposing on the set of the Blues Brothers. But after filming was completed, the relationship fizzled, and Fisher got back together with Simon. In 1990, a week after breaking up with Paul Simon for good, Fisher met and started dating Brian Lord, a senior agent at the Creative Artist Agency. They were together for three years and had a daughter named Billy in 1992. A year later, Lord left Fisher for a man, although the two of them remained close. As Fisher wrote in Wishful Drinking, Brian took such good care of me that I thought, this guy will make a good father. And I was right. He made a great father, and he still does. In October 2016, Lord married his longtime boyfriend, Bruce Bozzi. Billy Lord has credited her father with providing stability that the otherwise mostly wonderful life she had with her mother often lacked. As she told Town & Country in 2017, he gets home at the same time every day, and we eat dinner together. We do homework together. At Mom's, it was like, let's put Christmas lights in the palm trees at 2 a.m. Did you, as a kid, have over-the-top birthday parties like Christina Crawford used to? Yeah, there was an elephant at one party. <gasps> wow! When Fisher was cast in Star Wars, the production team asked the already slim actress to lose even more weight. They even sent her to what she called a fat farm. She returned the same size and spent the shoot paranoid about being fired. She later admitted in an interview with the Daily Beast that she had serious issues with body dysmorphia. She would continue to feel beat up over her weight for the rest of her life, and her friends often worried that she was too thin. Yeah, I heard they asked you to lose weight. They did. They always do. In her 2011 memoir, Shockaholic, Fisher revealed that the medication she took to help with her bipolar contributed to her gaining weight. In theory, she was fine with this, but in practice, it bothered her. As she wrote, I've always wished that I was someone who really didn't care what I looked like, but I do. In 2010, Fisher became a spokeswoman for diet program Jenny Craig. But when Disney called her to reprise the role of Leia for 2015's The Force Awakens, they also sent a personal trainer. Ever the rebel, she reportedly refused to do the exercises and snuck cans of Coca-Cola, as many as 16 per day. Even in space, women are, you know, there's, there's a double standard. For Carrie Fisher, the phrase electroconvulsive therapy used to conjure up frightening images from one flew over the cuckoo's nest. But the treatment has evolved a lot over the decades, and for Fisher, it helped her treat a major bout of depression, which had led to a drug relapse and a temporary separation from her daughter. In Shockaholic, Fisher wrote that she couldn't remember the experience of getting ECT for the first time. But she also clarified that treatments now typically include an anesthetic and an anticonvulsant before the shocks, which means no thrashing around in agony. She started with three treatments three times per week, then moved to one every six weeks. As she wrote, 
This f***ing thing punched the dark lights out of my depression. It did for me what drugs had done for me. It was like a mute button muffling the noise of my shrieking feelings. The downside was the negative impact on her short-term memory, but as she put it, ultimately though, who gives a sh why I can't remember what I can't remember when I feel so much better, right? But you know what? When you're in the mental hospital, it's, it's kind of okay because it can't get any worse. After Eddie Fisher left his family, his two kids lived with their mother. Debbie Reynolds was a devoted mom, but she worked a lot, which sometimes made young Carrie Fisher feel neglected. Fisher's own eventual fame also tested their relationship. Both mother and daughter were 19 when they starred in movies that made them instant icons, Reynolds and Singing in the Rain and Fisher and Star Wars. Fisher struggled with the idea that she had to share her mother with her fans, and Reynolds struggled to see her daughter's fame overtake her own. Todd Fisher wrote in his memoir, My Girls, that his sister thought that their mother was always trying to compete with her, although he felt that the competition was mutual. Mother and daughter reportedly didn't speak with each other during Carrie's 20s, but by the end of both of their lives, they were extremely close, and still arguing. In 2010, Reynolds told the New York Times, Carrie and I have disagreements and stalemates, but we still walk away loving each other. Their closeness later in life even extended to Reynolds passing away one day after her daughter died in 2016. Carrie Fisher died on December 27, 2016, four days after she'd had a heart attack on a plane. In June 2017, the coroner's report stated that the official cause of her death was sleep apnea, in which air can't get into the lungs during sleep or unconsciousness. Additionally, tests showed that her blood contained traces of cocaine, heroin, morphine, and MDMA, although it wasn't clear whether these had contributed to her death. Fisher had been open about the fact she'd occasionally relapsed into drug use. Her daughter, Billy Lord, issued a statement to People magazine in response in which she wrote, My mom battled drug addiction and mental illness her entire life. She ultimately died of it. She was purposefully open in all of her work about the social stigma surrounding these diseases. Lord added, She talked about the shame that torments people and their families confronted by these diseases. I know my mom. She'd want her death to encourage people to be open about their struggles. Did you know that Chris Rock was bullied growing up? How about the fact that his three-year stint on SNL was an unhappy one? Curious to know more heartbreaking details about Chris Rock? Keep watching. Chris Rock dealt with bullying as a kid growing up in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. Attending an all-white school, Rock's bullying experience began in second grade and lasted until high school, where he eventually dropped out during 10th grade. In an appearance on The Howard Stern Show, he called those years a horrible existence and related them to Tim Robbins' experience in The Shawshank Redemption. Rock said he was regularly called the N-word and had to endure beatings. Rock said that he discovered one of his former bullies working as a security guard on his movie set, a bully who used to shake Rock upside down to steal his money. Rock said the bully appeared ashamed and acknowledged him politely, leaving Rock aware that the man's embarrassment was punishment enough. It's like his sin has punished him. He could have been my friend. During an appearance on Inside the Actor's Studio, Rock claimed that those years were formative for him and credited his bully's abuse for his drive for success and his wit. In his stand-up special, Tambourine, Rock decried coddling in modern parenting and believed that most people who are successful have dealt with bullying at some point, since adversity prepares them for adulthood. Chris Rock received a breakthrough into comedy when he was invited onto the cast of Saturday Night Live in 1990. His castmates included SNL Titans and lifelong friends Adam Sandler, Chris Farley, and David Spade. However, Rock was the only black cast member on the show in four years, the last being Denitra Vance, who left in 1986. With his unique position, Rock was constantly pigeonholed as legendary comedian Eddie Murphy's successor, but the two comics had completely different styles, and Rock felt the sketch comedy show never played to his strengths. Additionally, his ideas were sidelined, and the roles he was given were stereotypical. He was asked to play a Yubanji tribesman, which Rock said felt racist since he was the only black actor, according to his interview with the podcast WTF with Mark Maron. The newer sketch comedy show in Living Color provided Rock with the opportunity to broadcast his comedic style. Rock told Marin that compared to SNL, and Living Color was blacker and he wanted to be in a place where he no longer had to translate the comedy he wanted to do. When Rock made his plans to join in Living Color known to SNL producers, he was formally fired, ending a three-season career. Unfortunately for Chris Rock, his plans to project his true comedic voice on a competing sketch comedy show were short-lived. He only appeared in six episodes when In Living Color was suddenly cancelled. During Adam Sandler's monologue on SNL in 2019, Rock joked about his abrupt post-SNL failure, singing, Then I went on and live in living color. Yeah! 
Three weeks later, they took it off TV. <laughs> After that failed stint, Rock entered a transition period of sorts until he would ultimately find stardom. He first wrote and starred in the comedy film CB4 in 1993 about wannabe rappers. The film received lukewarm reviews from the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times, the latter of which accused CB4 of being formulaic. He then covered the 1996 presidential campaign for Comedy Central's Politically Incorrect. He also made an HBO comedy special in 1994. However, none of these projects made the sort of impact Rock was perhaps hoping for. Afterward, he went on tour at small venues in order to bolster his career and hone his craft, leading to his big break, the 1996 HBO special Bring the Pain. Chris Rock knew the night he spent at Chris Farley's Chicago apartment would be their last time together. In an Explain This Video for Esquire, Rock recalled leaving Farley's apartment after being given a tour and catching a glimpse of his friend from his window. He thought to himself, and I was like, ah, that's probably the last time I'm gonna see him. He said they tried to meet later, but due to Farley's addiction, those plans never came through. Farley died of a cocaine and morphine overdose on December 18, 1997. Rock and Farley, along with Adam Sandler and David Spade, were known as the bad boys of SNL, creating a legendary era for the historic sketch comedy show. The office they shared together was finally nicknamed The Dorm. Friends for life, all three castmates were present for Farley's Hollywood Walk of Fame ceremony in August 2005, where he was honored posthumously with a star. Referencing Farley's tendency to use his physical size for comedic advantage, Rock said, I think every fat comedian owes him 80 bucks that's working today. Chris Rock filed for divorce in December 2014, ending his 18-year marriage to Malak Compton. The divorce took nearly two years to get finalized and included a custody battle for their two daughters. In an interview with Rolling Stone, Rock admitted that he wasn't a good husband at times. He had extramarital affairs with several women, believing he was sanctioned for bad behavior due to his wealth and fame. Rock said his now former wife wanted 52% of custody of their children, and he cried during the custody battle. However, he said that a divorce provided the opportunity to start over in his career, saying, It's not a breakdown, but something in your life broke down. He later bought a house in New Jersey close to his ex-wife in order to be near his daughters. Shortly after, Rock started doing bits during his shows concerning the separation, which included faulting himself for his relationship's failure and observing how much his ex-wife hated him. But he eventually stopped talking about his marriage, noting, it's not fair. I have a mic. She doesn't. In his Netflix special, Tambourine, Rock detailed the circumstances that led to the divorce, including a porn addiction. He said watching a lot of porn numbed him toward sexuality, which led to poor social communication, which he called, quote, sexual autism. In 2014, Chris Rock skipped ahead of the cultural zeitgeist when it came to race relations in Hollywood, months before the Oscar So White campaign gripped the industry, and wrote an essay in The Hollywood Reporter about being black in Hollywood. The magazine described his chosen topic as Hollywood's third rail, but it feels prescient in hindsight. In the piece, Rock labeled Hollywood a white industry. He also accused Hollywood of hiring the same black actors consistently while not giving others a way in. He bemoaned the lack of black men hired for management roles, alleging that these opportunities are usually given to black women with Ivy League backgrounds. He also said that black-led films are scrutinized to a degree that white majority films aren't, and black actors are always hired deliberately and never on a short list with white actors. In the essay, Rock relates a time when he wanted a role in the 2004 film Startsky and Hutch, but was only offered the opportunity to play Huggy Bear. At the BET Awards in 2019, he made a joke at Jesse Smollett's expense, saying Smollett was a waste of light skin. Rock joked that if he had Smollett's skin color, he would have taken over Hollywood by now. Chris Rock began therapy after testing himself for Asperger's, according to an interview in The Telegraph. Instead, he was diagnosed with nonverbal learning disorder, which affects one's ability to understand nonverbal communication and notice visual patterns. His diagnoses made him realize that the disorder affected his behavior and relationships. In the past, whenever he received personal criticism, he just figured it was because he was a celebrity and assumed people misunderstood who he truly was. According to Rock, he now realizes that he's responsible for how others view him. The diagnosis also led him to seeking therapy, which involved sessions seven hours a week. It allowed him to confront childhood trauma that had long remained dormant. During an appearance on The Howard Stern Show, Rock said he suffered from a big ego and low self-esteem. His self-worth stems from his work as a comedian. Off the stage, however, Rock struggles with the idea of deserving attention or affection. In an interview with Gail King on CBS, Rock said that he's forgiven his bullies. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to assume all my bullies are better people. Chris Rock's mother, Rose, was once diagnosed with cancer. To make matters worse, it coincided with his divorce negotiations. Rose received treatment at Sloan Kettering in New York, which was on the same street as Rock's divorce lawyer, and his mother stayed with him in the same New Jersey home he bought after his divorce while he took care of her. He said he prayed that his daughters were at their mother's in case their grandmother died. Thankfully, she recovered. 
Rose Rock published a book with HarperCollins titled Mama Rock Rules, 10 Secrets for Raising a Houseful of Successful Children. You know, my claim to fame really is being Chris Rock's mom, but I'm so much more than that. In an interview with the New York Daily News, Rose said her son's sense of humor began as a defense mechanism. His small stature made him vulnerable to teasing, so he used comedy to gain an upper hand. She once believed he'd become a writer, noting that he used to load papers for the Daily News while his father served as a driver. On September 19, 2021, Chris Rock alerted the world of his COVID-19 infection through his Twitter account, tweeting, Hey guys, I just found out I have COVID. Trust me, you don't want this. Get vaccinated. Rock was immunized at the time as he received the vaccine in May 2021. When he was on The Tonight Show, he joked about using his fame to get a vaccine quickly, comparing himself to Billy Zane's character in Titanic fleeing the sinking ship. During an appearance at New York City's Blue Note Jazz Club, Rock said that he may have contracted the illness while on a movie set and that his experience with it was difficult. In an interview with Gail King in January 2021, Rock said he was enthusiastic to receive the vaccine. In reference to vaccine hesitancy among the black community, Rock compared taking the shot to taking Tylenol. Do I know what's in Tylenol? I don't know what's in Tylenol, Gail. I just know my headache's gone. During Oscars night 2022, Chris Rock became the target of the slap heard around the world. The incident was shocking to a lot of viewers, but perhaps not to those few who were aware of a long-standing tension between Rock and Will Smith and his wife Jada Pinkett Smith. Rock's jokes at Pinkett Smith's expense date back to 1997, when Rock had a talk show on HBO. He made fun of Pinkett Smith's speech at the Million Women March, garnering boos from his audience. It seems as if Rock has a penchant for teasing Pinkett Smith about her activism. He made another joke about her when he hosted the 2016 Oscars. At the time, Pinkett Smith was boycotting the ceremony due to the Oscars So White controversy. While on stage, Rock made fun of her boycott, implying that Pinkett Smith hadn't been invited anyway. What surprised some fans was that Rock and Pinkett Smith were co-stars when they voiced characters in the popular and lucrative Madagascar franchise. However, they hadn't worked together since 2012. Rock also has a history with her husband, Will. Rock appeared on an episode of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, playing a female character who Will must take out on a date. During an appearance on The Late Show with David Letterman, Rock joked about having to compete for roles with Will Smith, saying to the camera, Will Smith, don't you have enough? <laughs> Damn you, Will Smith! Funny Men Mel Brooks' career has spanned eight decades. He's an icon of comedy on both stage and screen. But alongside his many successes has come failure on both personal and professional levels. This is his tragic real-life story. Mel Brooks came into the world on June 28, 1926, as Melvin Kaminsky, the youngest of four boys born on a kitchen table in his parents' Brooklyn tenement apartment. While many comedians had terrible childhoods and used comedy as a way to seek attention, Brooks was the opposite. According to the biography, It's Good to Be the King, The Seriously Funny Life of Mel Brooks, he was used to being the baby of the family and constantly showered with love. Well into adulthood, he felt a need to be at the center of attention at all times. This attitude is clear in one of Brooks' most famous interviews for Playboy in 1975. He rarely answered a question without making a joke, that is, until he was asked about his father, Max Kaminsky, who died of tuberculosis of the kidney when young Melvin was only two years old. During the interview, he talked about the intimacy of male relationships in his movie Blazing Saddles, as he explained, I can't tell you what sadness, what pain it is to me never to have known my own father. If only I could look at him, touch his face, see if he had eyebrows. Maybe in having the male characters in my movies find each other, I'm expressing the longing I feel to find my father and be close to him. In that 1975 Playboy interview, Brooks also revealed that he and most of the other Jewish kids in his neighborhood didn't swim because they would get picked on by other kids. If they did go to the pool, they had to travel in packs to protect themselves. Even in his predominantly Jewish neighborhood, he was, in his own words, scrawny. But he found another way to make himself valuable. As he put it, Why should they let this puny kid hang out with them? I gave them a reason. I became their jester. Also, they were afraid of my tongue. I had it sharpened and I'd stick it in their eye. Brooks' humor was inspired by feeling marginalized as a Jewish kid in America and by the long-suffering history of the Jewish people. He often felt that he couldn't get the girl because he wasn't tall enough or blonde enough. And when it came to the legacy of Jewish mourning, he wanted to respond to it with laughter instead of tears. As he told Playboy in 1966, if your enemy is laughing, how can he bludgeon you to that? 
Mel Brooks and his three older brothers all served in World War II. Brooks himself was anti-war, but he felt determined to fight because he thought this war was just. He wanted to defend the Jewish people against Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime. But ironically, though Brooks joined the army to fight anti-Semitism, he often endured that same prejudice from his fellow soldiers, who would call him by an ethnic slur. During a 2001 appearance on 60 Minutes, he discussed getting even with Hitler. As he explained, you have to bring him down with ridicule, because if you stand on a soapbox and you match him with rhetoric, you're just as bad as he is. But if you can make people laugh at him, then you're one up on him. Before Brooks made a career out of making fun of Hitler, he did his best comedy while serving in the army. He would play the music of Jewish singer Al Jolson over a loudspeaker while the Germans played their propaganda. And at the end of my song, I heard a little applause. Being a Jewish-American fighter came with an additional potential risk if you ended up captured. When Brooks's brother Lenny had to bail out of his plane, he took off his dog tags because they had an H for Hebrew on him, out of a fear that he could get sent to the concentration camps. Brooks got his start in comedy at age 14 by working as a drummer, which led to the decision to change his last name because Kaminsky was too long to fit in writing on the drum. One night while playing in the Catskills, he subbed in for another comic who had fallen ill. He was sweaty and unsteady, but he found a way to make the audience laugh. Then, while he served in World War II, he used his comedic and musical sensibilities to entertain the troops. It wasn't until the 50s that he got his first steady job in comedy as a writer on Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows. But while it was a plum gig, it also brought with it a lot of anxiety. In his 1975 Playboy interview, Brooks described his contributions to the show as full of, quote, energy and insanity. He felt tremendous pressure as one of the funniest writers of the time. When the topic of mental health came up in the interview, he revealed, I started having acute anxiety attacks. I used to vomit a lot between parked Plymouths in midtown Manhattan. Sometimes I'd get so anxiety-stricken I'd have to run because I'd be generating too much adrenaline to do anything but run or scream. Eventually, Brooks sought out therapy, which helped him calm down and grow up. Mel Brooks met his first wife, Florence Baum, on Broadway when she was a dancer in the musical Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. They married in November 1953 and went on to have three children together, Stephanie, Nicholas, and Edward. After Your Show of Shows was canceled, Brooks continued to work with Sid Caesar on his next show, Caesar's Hour. At this time, he was more focused on his career and hanging out with his co-workers than he was on spending time with his family. He had a hard time adjusting to marital life and often worried that he would embarrass his wife with his boisterous behavior. After the cancellation of Caesar's Hour in 1957, Brooks endured a long lull in his career as he found himself an unemployed husband and father of three. In 1960, wanting to escape his situation, he moved in with a friend in Los Angeles. Upon his return to New York the following year, he discovered that Mom was suing him for illegal separation. He later admitted, we married too young. In 1961, Brooks was newly single and still looking for work when he met actress Anne Bancroft. She was a two-time Tony Award winner, and he knew how to make her laugh. They got married in 1964. Soon after, he had a breakout success when he co-created the TV show Get Smart, which premiered in 1965. But his real dream was to work in film. So he wrote the screenplay for the producers, and he knew that he'd have to direct it to keep his vision intact. But all the major studios laughed at his intention to make a comedy about Hitler. He eventually secured financing from a producer named Joseph Levine. But the film was ultimately met with tepid box office numbers and some harsh reviews, although Brooks did win an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay. In a 2019 interview with USA Today, Brooks discussed some of the least friendly reactions he received about the producers. Rabbis wrote letters to him, expressing disappointment in him as a Jewish person for writing a comedy about Hitler. So Brooks wrote all of them back to explain his theory about the power of using humor as a means of humiliation. Don't be stupid, be a smarty, come and join the Nazi party! Despite winning an Oscar for the producers, nobody saw Mel Brooks as much of a success at that point in his career. His next film, 1970's The Twelve Chairs, had an even smaller budget and it had to be shot in Yugoslavia. As Brooks recalled to Playboy in 1975, When I went to Yugoslavia, my hair was black. When I came back nine months later, it was gray. One time during shooting, he got so angry that he threw his director's chair into the Adriatic Sea. Afterwards, the entire crew went on strike. 
According to the cinematographer, they did so because Yugoslavia was a communist country, and they were unhappy that he threw the chair because it was technically public property. The 12 chairs ultimately wound up playing at only a few art house theaters. Nevertheless, to this day, Brooks insists that it's his favorite film. Afterwards, he began working on the script for Blazing Saddles, which would go on to become a huge hit and an enduring comedy classic. As he recalled to Playboy in 1975, it was designed as an esoteric little picture. I had no idea Middle America would see it. Excuse me while I whip this out. <laughs> After the twin successes of Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein in 1974, Brooks became a major power player in Hollywood. But then his career seesawed in the following years. He enjoyed mild success with his next film, 1976's Silent Movie, but then he had another flop the next year with the Alfred Hitchcock spoof High Anxiety. He didn't have another hit until 1981's History of the World Part 1, and then not again after that until Spaceballs in 1987. Between those two, he was an executive producer on a disastrous sci-fi film called Solar Babies, which he claimed made him go broke. After the movie's release in 1986, Brooks was in a dark place because he was in so much debt. As he recalled in an interview on the podcast How Did This Get Made, I'm practically ready to jump off a roof, you know? I mean a roof like the Empire State Building. I'm ready to go. Solar Babies initially had a $5 million budget that eventually grew all the way to $23 million. Brooks was the one on the hook to find all that extra money, which included taking out a second mortgage on his home. Ultimately, the film made less than a million dollars at the box office and was panned by critics. Mel Brooks and Anne Bancroft always seemed like an unlikely Hollywood couple. Nevertheless, they managed to stay together through thick and thin for over four decades. While they were dating, she won an Oscar for her portrayal of Anne Sullivan in The Miracle Worker. But it was her role as Mrs. Robinson in 1967's The Graduate that truly made her an icon. When Brooks and Bancroft met in 1961, they were both in the process of leaving their first spouses. Neither of them was yet a household name, but their careers were moving right along. They had a son named Max in 1972, and they remained happily married until Bancroft died of uterine cancer in 2005. Max, who would grow up to be a successful writer himself, spoke about his parents during a 2019 episode of CBS This Morning. It was only later when I got out into the world I realized that most people are not as animated and most people are not as funny. Mel Brooks met his longtime comedy partner Carl Reiner when they were both working on your show of shows. During that time, they came up with the character of the 2,000-year-old man as a joke that they would tell each other for fun. Then it became a comedy routine that they performed at parties, and after that, they recorded the act for five comedy albums that they produced between 1960 and 1997, even earning them a Grammy in 1998. In a 2020 interview with The Guardian, Reiner recalled a first meeting Brooks. I thought, who is this guy? This guy is the funniest single human being on the planet. And for about two and a half hours, Mel and I ad-libbed, I cut it down to 47 minutes, and the 2,000-year-old man was more. Brooks and Reiner's friendship lasted 70 years, longer than either man was married. They vacationed together with their families and spurred each other on as they both directed some of the biggest comedy movies of the 70s and 80s. Later in life, they spent almost every day together at each other's homes watching TV and making jokes. When they couldn't see each other in person during the coronavirus pandemic in 2020, they got on the phone while watching Jeopardy! and Wheel of Fortune at the same time. That June, Reiner passed away of natural causes at the age of 98. As Brooks told The Guardian that year, I don't think I've ever had a better friend than Carl. Already a famous child star, Natalie Wood's acting career blossomed in the 1950s and 60s. But even before her mysterious tragic death in 1981, Wood led a tumultuous Hollywood life. Here are some heartbreaking details about Natalie Wood. Natalie Wood was born Natalia Nikolaevna Zakarenko to Russian immigrant parents in San Francisco and grew up in poverty amid a complex family situation. While Wood was adored by her parents, both had their vices. Her father, Nick, worked hard to provide for his family, but the struggles of trying to survive during and after the Great Depression, as well as anti-immigrant discrimination, contributed to his alcoholism. Wood's mother, Maria, had her own issues, being described as spirited, but morally gray. Maria loved her children, but the Russian refugee was described as a pathological liar by her youngest daughter, Lana. One could never be 100% sure that what came out of the dramatic, superstitious Maria's mouth was the truth. 
In a sense, Wood's mother was a bit of an actress herself, reinventing herself as she saw fit and playing new roles in the film of her life. It was likely Maria's fixation with make-believe, in addition to a fortune teller predicting that her second child would be known throughout the world, that led her to obsess over Natalie. While Natalie Wood was renowned for her talent and star quality from a very young age, it's hard to know whether the actress would have entered the entertainment field herself if she'd never been groomed for the cameras by her mother. Since she missed the chance to become a performer herself, Maria feverishly pushed her daughters into the entertainment industry. As a child, Wood was genuinely talented at acting, but she was also impressionable and eager to please her mother. According to Suzanne Finstad, in Natasha, the biography of Natalie Wood, Wood's older sister Olga denies their mother's claims that young Natasha, Natalie's nickname as a child, was the one who expressed an interest in acting. Four-year-old Natasha was a natural when she performed, but she was not movie-struck. Maria was the one stalking movie crews, seeking parts for herself and Natasha. Natasha just went along. Maria's obsession with making her second daughter a star would lead to some harsh behavior. As told by the BBC, Wood's mother once prepped her for a crying scene by ripping the wings off of a live butterfly. Finstad also described similar episodes, with Maria bringing up the family's dead dog or telling other harsh stories about animal cruelty in order to get her daughter emotionally distraught for a scene. By the time nine-year-old Natalie Wood was slated to do a scene that involved running across a bridge, the child actress was already wary of water. According to Suzanne Finstad, Wood was highly influenced to fear water by her mother, who had been told by a fortune teller that she would die drowning. Olga, Natalie's older sister, explained, My mother was afraid of swimming, and she was told that she'd drown, so this communicated itself to Natalie. My mother would never learn to swim either because she didn't know who was going to drown. This phobia of water manifested itself in the young actress in a number of ways, including a refusal to learn how to swim and a fear of submerging her head underwater to have her hair washed. In a scarily foreshadowing episode, Wood's aquaphobia got worse on the set of The Green Promise when the nine-year-old was involved in an accident that led to her nearly drowning. As described by Harper's Bazaar, the scene involved Wood running across a bridge that would collapse once she was on the other side. Unfortunately, the bridge fell through while the child actress was still on it, leaving her with a broken wrist and a strengthened, lifelong fear of water. The starlet would wear bracelets on her left wrist for the rest of her life, in order to cover the protruding bone that remained visible after the accident. After years of researching her biography on Wood, Suzanne Finstad was able to reveal a tragic episode that occurred when the actress was only 16. The episode happened when Wood was called up to a hotel suite to read for a part for her childhood idol. Tragically, the young actress was then brutally assaulted by, as Finstad describes, a married movie star who was 20 years Wood's senior. Threatened and traumatized, Wood never reported it, telling only a handful of friends. Throughout the remainder of the actress's life, her attack remained a secret, but in 2018, on the podcast Fatal Voyage, The Mysterious Death of Natalie Wood, Wood's sister Lana confirmed the attack, adding in the details that it occurred at the Chateau Marmont Hotel. Lana also had this to say about her sister's attack. Many, many years later, Natalie only alluded to the fact that something bad had happened and, in a way, blamed my mom for being too eager for Natalie to get roles. Natalie Wood worked during an era in Hollywood when studios had full ownership over actors' careers. Actresses like Wood, who was trapped under this system since she was a child, rarely had control over the roles they took. Over the years, though, as she became older and more successful, Wood began to fight back. In 1959, the actress refused roles in The Miracle and A Summer Place. To drive her point even further, she refused to appear on set for the filming of The Young Philadelphians. Rather than simply letting her go, Warner Brothers proceeded to put her on suspension for 18 months, the punishment being that if she wouldn't work for Warner Brothers, she couldn't work for anywhere else. The studio went on to publicly claim that Wood's break from acting was due to salary disputes, but the young actress made it clear that it was about parts. Fortunately, her standoff with studio head Jack Warner actually led to a small victory, with Wood winning the right to choose one picture a year. Her first choice? The blockbuster West Side Story. When teen star Natalie Wood and up-and-coming heartthrob Robert Wagner first got together, they were Hollywood's fairy tale couple and a hot topic for teen gossip. Their relationship was actually set up by the studios in 1956 as a way to promote both the 18-year-old actress and 26-year-old actor, but the feelings became real and the two married a year later. 
Unfortunately, the so-called perfect couple suddenly called it quits in 1961, stirring up rumors that the marriage failed due to Wood's infidelity. For decades, an affair with her co-star, Warren Beatty, was the accepted killer of the Wood-Wagner union. However, recent digging by Suzanne Finstad revealed that this was untrue. In talking with a few of Wood's close friends, her mother's best friend, and Wood's sister, Finstad found that it was actually Wood who was cheated on. In an unreleased memoir, Wood wrote, It is too painful for me to recall in print the incident that led to the final breakup. It was more than a final straw. It was reality crushing the fragile web of romantic fantasies with sledgehammer force. Still, while the incident was serious enough to lead to the dissolution of their marriage, the two were able to reconcile, remarrying a decade later. To this day, Wagner denies that he ever had an affair while married to Wood. After her first marriage to Robert Wagner ended, Natalie Wood went through an unfortunate downward spiral. She began a relationship with Warren Beatty, which lasted two years, but was filled with toxicity. Following her breakup with Beatty in 1964, Wood continued to go through a string of famous men, including actor Michael Caine, with whom she starred alongside in the 1975 film Peeper. Meanwhile, the mid-60s proved to also be unforgiving to her career. Many of Wood's films during this period flopped, including 1967's Sex and the Single Girl and 1965's The Great Race. To add insult to injury, Wood was even awarded Harvard Lampoon's Worst Actress of the Year Award. Once got a, uh, an award, I don't remember the exact title, but it was something like Worst Actress of the Year. I can't remember um, the, the exact title either. <laughs> Her failed films and Rocky Love Life had the actress in a bad state mentally and emotionally, with Wood at one point staying in bed and refusing to see anyone but her psychiatrist and former secretary. By 1966, the failures of her recent films and relationships had taken a serious toll on Natalie Wood. According to Warren Harris, author of Natalie and RJ, the star-crossed love affair of Natalie Wood and Robert Wagner, Wood was already in a bad psychological state when ex-boyfriend Warren Beatty showed up without any warning in order to convince her to join his next movie. She had already refused once, adamantly against the idea of not having access to her therapist for those months of filming in Texas. While no one knows how the exchange between the two went, what is known is that right after Beatty left, Wood attempted to take her own life by swallowing following a handful of barbiturates. Somewhere between taking the pills and falling unconscious, Wood must have changed her mind because her housemate, Mart Grawley, heard her call for him. He found her unconscious on the stairs and immediately took her to the hospital, where they pumped her stomach. When her sister visited her at the hospital, Wood confessed, I didn't want to live anymore. Now I do. After the incident, the actress took a break from working for three years in order to focus on her mental health. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK-8255. In an awful incident that is remembered and pondered to this day, Natalie Wood died on November 29, 1981, at only 43 years old. The exact circumstances of her death remain unknown, but the details of the events leading up to it go like this. As documented by Harper's Bazaar, Wood and her husband, Robert Wagner, frequently visited Catalina Island on their yacht, Splendor, and had decided to embark on the familiar trip after Thanksgiving. Actor Christopher Walken and the yacht's captain, Dennis Deverne, joined the couple. After a boozy night out on Catalina, the foursome left a restaurant and stumbled their way back to the yacht around 10.30 p.m. About a half hour later, the group noticed that Wood had disappeared, along with the boat's dinghy, but it took over four hours before the Coast Guard was called at 3.30 a.m. It wasn't until 8 a.m. that her body was found about a mile from the yacht. During the autopsy, it was discovered that Wood's blood alcohol content was 0.14% and that she had several bruises across her body, prompting the medical examiner's office to declare on November 30th that her death was an accident, with Wood likely falling overboard when trying to board the dinghy. The case was officially closed on December 11th, but speculation over the real details of her death would persist long after. The suspicious aspects of Natalie Wood's death would keep the public from accepting it was an accident for four decades. In 2011, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department reopened her case after receiving additional information from unidentified sources who contacted the authorities. I think what's important is to get to the bottom of what actually did happen, and I think that's what they should be allowed to do. That same year, Dennis Deverne explicitly stated that he had lied to the police during the first investigation, claiming that Robert Wagner, who he heard get into a heated argument with Wood, was responsible for the actress's death. 
By 2013, Wood's cause of death was changed to drowning and other undetermined factors. And five years later, Wagner was declared a person of interest in the case, although he continues to deny any involvement. In 2020, Suzanne Finstad revealed that she had found additional information which suggests that Wood's death wasn't an accident. Most enlightening was Dr. Michael Franco's observations from when he was an intern at the LA coroner's office. He had noticed that the abrasions on Wood's legs were in a direction that suggested she was getting pushed off a boat, not trying to get on. However, Dr. Franco's concerns fell on deaf ears, with the coroner telling him, quote, some things are best left unsaid. It would take nearly 40 years for Dr. Franco to come forward sharing his suspicions of a cover-up with the investigators in charge of the reopened case. Cruelty, self-doubt, and tragedy. Hollywood loves a comeback kid, but what has Brendan Fraser been through to get here? The film industry is rife with objectification, an issue that overwhelmingly affects women. Less discussed, however, is the increasing trend of sexualizing men on screen. Actors have pointed out that this is no less demeaning, and one performer who was heavily objectified early in his career was Brendan Fraser. Much of the success in his early career involved going shirtless, particularly in one of his best-known early movies, George of the Jungle, in which he spent most of his screen time dressed only in a loincloth. Fraser holds a less-than-stellar view of how he used to be portrayed. In 2018, he told GQ, I look at myself then and I just see a walking stake. The Jungle King was pleased to find he looked pretty good in Armani. Pretty darn good. All the same, he admits that this role as a buff but naive himbo was what ultimately earned his image as an action hero. All the same, the demands of this kind of role are exhausting, ultimately leading Fraser to turn down a reprisal of the role in George of the Jungle 2. Essentially, Fraser just didn't want to put himself through that much physical stress a second time. And while he may have passed over that role, the objectification that had plagued him in those days ultimately remained, setting the stage for several of his later problems. According to Fraser, in 2003, he was sexually assaulted by Philip Burke, a former president of the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. It was many years before he felt able to speak out about the incident. In his interview with GQ, Fraser explained how Burke groped him at an HFPA luncheon in the middle of a crowded room in the Beverly Hills Hotel. At the time, Fraser was left feeling overwhelmed with panic and fear, but the aftermath turned out to be even worse. After receiving a non-apology from Burke and the HFPA, he fell into depression and started to become reclusive. Soon, he was questioning who he was and what he was even doing in Hollywood. The attack on Fraser highlights that sexual assault is common for men in the film industry, with Vox reporting that 43% of men surveyed reported some kind of assault or harassment. For Brendan Fraser, it was the first of many issues that would almost destroy his acting career. He told GQ about how his work withered on the vine and how he felt like something had been taken from him. As well as retreating from view, Fraser found himself wondering if the HFPA had blacklisted him as he was seldom invited to the Golden Globes after 2003. Brendan Fraser's personal life often seems to have influenced his acting, and his early confidence is demonstrated by how close he came to the role that got away. In 2002, Fraser was in the running to play none other than Superman, and he was still clearly excited about dressing up as the hero, later explaining how it made him feel kind of invincible. Sadly for Fraser and his fans, the movie would ultimately be cancelled. He took the cancellation to heart and was left feeling like a failure. This was around 2003, when the alleged incident with Philip Burke had also damaged Fraser's sense of self-worth. Fraser subsequently took a role in Looney Tunes back in action purely for the chance to portray the worst version of himself and then publicly punch himself in the face. In his own words, I had it in my head that I had it coming. That's all, folks. Shortly afterward, feeling humiliated and despondent, Fraser largely retreated from public view. In times of difficulty, many people turn to their families for support, but Fraser would soon lose that option too. In 2009, he and his wife Afton Smith divorced, further derailing his career. The objectification piled on Brendan Fraser in the earlier years of his career seemed to never really go away, and it continued to plague him well into the 2010s. Tabloid newspapers such as the Daily Mail, well known for their mean-spirited celebrity gossip pieces, 
would periodically post unflattering photographs of him together with demeaning comments about his appearance. Websites like Gossip Mill weren't much better. In one instance, the site published an article that skirted over the fact that Fraser was taking a beach vacation to enjoy spending some time with his children, instead placing the focus on his apparent weight gain. Over the past decade, people have become increasingly aware of body shaming and its many deeply negative effects. In particular, the phenomenon is often specifically linked with fat shaming, which uses humiliation to exact a form of bullying. In more recent times, body shaming has become increasingly unacceptable in the public eye, and many of Fraser's fans have rallied to support him. The bullying of Fraser perpetuated by the tabloid media was only made worse by the fact that Fraser was physically unable to maintain his once athletic physique. This was because he was struggling with a number of extensive health issues, many of which required regular hospital visits. Brendan Fraser's time as an on-screen action hero came at the expense of his physical health. Around 2008, when filming was underway on the third Mummy movie, he had adopted a daily routine of covering himself in ice packs and tape, specifically choosing thin and light ice packs which could be concealed under clothing. Fraser's dangerous approach to action filming originated during production on 1991's Dogfight, his first movie. Fraser later told GQ that he likely bruised a rib during one stunt, but reacted with an attitude of, That's okay. I'll take it. I can do it again. If you want, I'll break it. Over a decade and a half later, this was taking a severe toll. Fraser's body became so badly damaged that he needed to spend seven years repeatedly visiting hospital after hospital for numerous surgeries and procedures. The worst of these were extreme. He required multiple back surgeries to repair damage to his spine, as well as a partial knee replacement, which both must have also required physical therapy and considerable recovery time. Additionally, he underwent a throat operation to repair his vocal cords. All of this was costly and, according to the New York Post, led to some financial difficulties. Worse still, he was also bound by law to pay alimony and child support payments to the eye-watering sum of $900,000 a year. In 2016, Brendan Fraser's appearance in an interview on AOL's Build channel left many viewers concerned. Soft-spoken and seemingly downcast, many fans worried that he was depressed. Speaking later with GQ, Fraser explained how he probably didn't even realize how he was feeling at the time, but during the interview, he was grieving the death of his mother. He also admitted that he'd been keeping out of the spotlight for so long that it was a shock to the system to be back in the hot seat. Oh, this is how it works. Hi, kids. Um. <laughs> It had been some time since Fraser had made a formal press appearance, and the show he was promoting was one he had barely featured in. What's more, the format of the AOL show felt new and unfamiliar. In his own words, I felt like, man, I got old. Damn, this is the way it's done now? It was as if the world had kept on turning without him for the whole time he had been hidden from the public eye. Even The Mummy, the franchise he was most famous for, no longer involved him. The 2017 movie was a reboot starring Tom Cruise. It wasn't until 2018 that Brendan Fraser finally spoke out about being a victim of sexual assault, and even then, he was hesitant to do so. There is, of course, good reason for this. Survivors often have trouble coming forward for many reasons. Fraser's was that he struggled to contend with how the assault made him feel and that he didn't want it to become a defining part of his life. For 15 years, he kept quiet until he was finally empowered to say something by the Me Too movement. Brendan Fraser joining the Me Too movement, opening up about allegedly being sexually assaulted. It's something that took him almost 15 years to talk about. Fraser spoke quite candidly about the difficulty of saying anything at all, explaining that he'd wanted to many times, but had talked himself out of it. He explained, Am I still frightened? Absolutely. Do I feel like I need to say something? Absolutely. It wasn't until he saw others he knew speak up that he felt ready to add his voice to the movement. Brendan Fraser has always been best known for starring in action movies. <laughs> In 2022, he was supposed to make his triumphant return to the genre with the release of DC's Batgirl. When he was cast in the movie, Variety reported that he would be playing the villainous Firefly, a vengeful and nihilistic pyromaniac. In the comics, the more famous version of Firefly was abused during his youth. Driven to poverty and with nowhere else to turn, 
He developed an obsession with fire and took up work as a professional arsonist. While Fraser himself is decidedly unvillainous in real life, it's easy to imagine how his involvement in Batgirl may have been informed by his own experiences in life. Aside from the alleged abuse he suffered at the hands of Philip Burke, Fraser also experienced a number of financial difficulties during his life. Following his divorce in 2009, the actor was paying $900,000 annually in child support and alimony. He tried to petition the courts to reduce the payments because of his lack of income, and in return, his ex-wife Afton Smith accused him of fraud. She claimed that he had hidden $9 million in new film contracts, even as he was losing thousands every month. It's obviously not a direct parallel, but the experience of feeling financially trapped may well have inspired Fraser's performance as Firefly. Sadly, we'll never know for sure. In August 2022, after filming on Batgirl had been more or less completed, the movie was canceled by Warner Brothers. The decision to can Batgirl was deeply disappointing to everyone involved, with Fraser specifically concerned that it might hurt his comeback efforts. Still, he remained selfless about the whole affair, graciously praising his co-star Leslie Grace, even as his return to the action genre went up in flames. With all of his life experience, it makes sense for Brendan Fraser to choose a project like The Whale. His character in Darren Aronofsky's psychological drama is a reclusive man affected by weight gain, both of which are issues that Fraser has experienced firsthand. Unfortunately, however, the movie was met with some controversy over Fraser's use of a fat suit in the role. Prosthetics like these have a deeply unpleasant history in cinema, with critics claiming that they have mostly been used to perpetuate fat phobia. Speaking with Vanity Fair, Fraser made a point to explain that, unlike the harmful use of bodysuits in comedy movies of the past, the portrayal of fatness in The Whale is not intended to be a joke. He told the outlet, I looked at other bodysuits that had been used in comedies over the years, usually for a one-note joke. Whether intended or not, the joke is, it defies gravity. This was not that. The actor himself clearly took it seriously too. During filming, he reportedly worked closely with the Obesity Action Coalition. Having mistreated his body for his work in the past, and having been a target of fat phobia himself, it's possible that audiences might remain sympathetic about what would otherwise be an extremely questionable creative decision. Either way, the Academy didn't seem to mind. In 2023, 20 years after the beginning of Fraser's career decline, his performance in The Whale won him an Academy Award for Best Actor. Did you know that Johnny Depp has struggled with an addiction to drugs and alcohol throughout his life? Depp's sister even staged an intervention with the actor, hoping the Pirates of the Caribbean star would get treatment. To learn more about Depp's tragic real-life story, keep watching. We've learned a lot about Johnny Depp and Amber Heard's broken marriage since their divorce began in 2016, but the defamation case, which Depp initiated in 2019, has also provided us with plenty of information about Depp's tragic childhood. Born on June 9, 1963 in Owensboro, Kentucky, John Christopher Depp II was the youngest of four children born to Betty Sue Palmer and John Christopher Depp. Throughout his childhood, his mother's abuse proved constant, unpredictable, violent, and cruel. He later remarked about these formative years, I felt completely and utterly confused by everything that was going on around me. On the witness stand, he explained that his childhood lacked both safety and security. Depp said his mother excelled at physical and verbal abuse with lots of bullying and name-calling. She proved especially good at lobbing cruel, personal attacks against her children, mocking them for various perceived physical defects. For example, Depp's brother wore glasses, and so his mother referred to him as Four Eyes. As for Depp, he had a rare congenital eye defect, which translated into a lazy eye and having to wear a patch. So, his mother created a list of mean taunts for him too including cockeye, one-eye, and anything else she could muster to steep him in shame. Coupled with cruelty and unpredictable behavior, Betty Sue Palmer had a restless nature that fueled constant family moves. In an interview with Oprah, Johnny Depp reported moving maybe 40 times before the age of 15. One of the most restless periods of his life occurred after his family left Kentucky for Florida. They ended up in Miramar, located in the southern part of the state near Miami. 
Depp remembers it as a place where very little actually happened, but he does recall the family living in motels after they first arrived. This is where the bulk of the 40 moves he quoted to Oprah took place. During this small period alone, he estimates the family shuttled between 20 to 30 different locations, resulting in a truly transient lifestyle. Danny White, author of Johnny Depp, The Unauthorized Biography, hypothesizes that this may be why Depp later gravitated towards playing outsiders as an actor. With so many relocations under his belt at such a young age, he lacked the stability and geographic longevity to become truly integrated into a community. Before launching his acting career on 21 Jump Street, Johnny Depp had dreams of making it big as a rock star. During his time in Miramar, Florida, he played with a group called The Kids, enjoying local fame. Eventually, they decided to take the leap and relocate to Los Angeles. Soon, Depp struggled as an unemployed musician. After marrying Lorianne Allison, a makeup artist, in 1983, she introduced him to her friend, Nicolas Cage. According to an interview with Oprah, Cage suggested Depp give acting a try, but Depp had never thought about this line of work before. Nevertheless, he needed to pay the rent and was on the edge of getting evicted, so he gave it a try. Cage arranged an audition for Depp with director Wes Craven, and Depp got cast in 1984's A Nightmare on Elm Street. As Vanity Fair reports, Craven's daughter Jessica helped pick Depp for the role of Glenn. While speaking to Vanity Fair, Depp jokingly said of his big break, At the time, I was a musician. I wasn't really acting. It was not anything very near to my brain or my heart, which is pretty much how it remains to this day. In 1985, Johnny Depp and Lori Ann Allison got divorced, and two years later he faced a different kind of break after parting ways with 21 Jump Street. By 1990, he worked with John Waters on Crybaby and Tim Burton on Edward Scissorhands. Both indie film directors permitted Depp to explore his talent in innovative ways. Winona Ryder played Depp's love interest in Edward Scissorhands, but they'd already started a romantic relationship in 1989 after meeting at the premiere of Great Balls of Fire. Guess what? I met a girl! Ryder played the young, naive bride of Jerry Lee Lewis opposite Dennis Quaid. For Depp, it was love at first sight, and before the two knew it, they moved in together. Depp quickly followed this living arrangement with a proposal, and the two looked like the ideal couple. Unfortunately, this meant the media hounded the duo at every turn. Despite his enthusiastic passion for his fiancée, which even inspired him to get the tattoo Winona Forever, their youthful relationship wouldn't last. Both celebrities found themselves on the rise at the same time, which meant little time or energy left for their relationship. No, I don't know. I don't like the scene in Hollywood. Depp publicly spoke about their split for the first time in June 1993, spinning it in a positive light. But a friend close to the actor said he remained in denial for months. By August of 1993, Johnny Depp bought The Viper Room, an infamous Los Angeles location with a colorful history. Acquiring the location let Depp reignite his first love, music. Some nights after closing, Depp would stay into the wee hours, indulging in private jam sessions. But the death of River Phoenix just two months later cast Johnny Depp's nightclub in a negative light. Speculation abounded about what had happened, and newspapers characterized the Viper Room as Depp's den of sex, drugs, and death. This speculation proved especially hurtful, as Depp had been close to Phoenix and mourned the loss of his friend deeply. Depp fought back against the tabloid treatment of his club and the mischaracterization of what had happened. The media especially honed in on the idea that people freely used drugs at the Viper Room, but Depp refuted such claims. In an interview with USA Today, he argued, To pinpoint one club or one street is really ridiculous. There's a tragic loss of a very gifted, very sweet, nice young man. In 2007, Johnny Depp faced every parent's worst nightmare. His daughter, Lily Rose Depp, seven, with ex-wife Vanessa Paradis, contracted E. coli, leading to kidney failure. Depp and Paradis spent nine days camped out at a hospital in London, unsure of whether their daughter would live. Fortunately, Lily Rose recovered, but the experience proved transformative for the actor. He has never forgotten how helpless he felt during the ordeal. 
In an interview on The Graham Norton Show, he stated, When my daughter was ill, that was the darkest period ever. In 2008, following his daughter's recovery, Depp donated $2 million to the Great Ormond Street Hospital. Although Depp always made a point of visiting children's hospitals, he increased these activities following his family's scare. After starring in Pirates of the Caribbean, dressing up as Captain Jack Sparrow became his regular modus operandi. But after his marriage to Amber Heard dissolved and she accused him of domestic abuse, Disney cut ties with the actor and his character Captain Jack Sparrow. This development made something as innocuous as visiting a children's hospital in costume complicated, to say the least. After marrying in 2015, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard's marriage quickly unraveled in a whirlwind of drug and alcohol abuse, as both parties allege. But when it comes to which person in the marriage endured the brunt of the violence, the former couple's stories differ. The accusations of violence began with Heard, who filed a restraining order against Depp after filing for divorce in 2016. During stunning testimony in his defamation lawsuit, Johnny Depp gave his side of the story. He detailed the verbal, emotional, and physical abuse he allegedly endured at the hands of his ex-wife, from having his finger partially cut off to finding human feces in his bed, the actor graphically described the horror of his marriage, finishing with the confession that he had been a victim of domestic violence. Depp stated during the trial, This is not life. No one should have to go through this. His bodyguard, Starling Jenkins, also took the witness stand to testify about a time when Heard allegedly threw Depp's phone off the balcony during a fight. Fortunately, Jenkins retrieved it from a homeless man on Skid Row. Once the couple agreed to divorce, the demands from Amber Heard began, as recorded in a demand letter entered as evidence in the defamation trial. These demands included Heard's desire to live rent-free in the apartments the couple had owned, along with $125,000 to help with her attorney's fees. She also asked for exclusive ownership of a black Range Rover, stipulating that Depp make the rest of the payments on it. In exchange for fulfilling the requirements of the letter, Heard promised to keep the divorce proceedings and personal details of their relationship out of the spotlight. As time progressed, however, Heard's demands increased, according to Edward White, Depp's business manager. During his testimony in the defamation trial, he claimed that Heard eventually asked for $4 million. But she didn't stop there. Next, her demand increased to $5 million, and then went up from there, spiking at $7 million with $500,000 in fees to her attorneys. Yet, White said the sky was the limit because Heard went on to demand all community liabilities accumulated during the marriage. The demands would continue until they reached $14,250,000 of consideration paid to her free of taxation. Amber Heard published a Washington Post op-ed in 2018 detailing domestic violence without directly naming Johnny Depp, but the timeline of events outlined meshed with those of their marriage. As a result, Depp claims Disney dropped him from Pirates of the Caribbean 6, where he stood to net $22.5 million. Other film studios dodged the actor too. Mike Spindler, a forensic accountant, calculated that Depp lost $40 million in Hollywood earnings after the op-ed. Unfortunately, his business manager, Edward White, had already sounded the alarm that Depp's finances were in serious disrepair. Just prior to Heard's 30th birthday, Depp learned he'd lost $650 million earned from movies due to alleged financial mismanagement. This included purportedly owing 17 years of back taxes to the IRS worth a total of $100 million. In 2019, Depp brought a defamation suit against Heard for $50 million, but Heard countered with a $100 million lawsuit. Her counsel argued that Depp's rejection of her abuse claims amount to defamation. After all, Heard positioned herself as an advocate for those facing domestic violence, writing in the op-ed, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. That has to change. However, Heard was arrested in 2009 for misdemeanor domestic violence against her then-girlfriend, Tazia Von Ray, which muddies the waters of a breakup awash in financial wreckage. During the defamation lawsuit, details emerged about Johnny Depp's struggles with drug and alcohol addiction. In a 2005 interview with Rolling Stone, Depp admitted, I spent years poisoning myself. I was very, very good at it. But during his testimony at the defamation trial, Depp discussed his attempts to end his addiction after an intervention by his sister, Christy Dombrowski, in 2014. 
Dr. David Kipper took the stand on the third day of Depp's defamation lawsuit, detailing the actor's history of drug use and attempts to get sober. He noted that Depp has a history of abusing opiates, alcohol, cocaine, and benzodiazepines, and that Depp sought his help with detoxing. During his testimony, Dr. Kipper described the many times that Depp attempted to stop the detoxification process, and he also discussed receiving text messages from the actor mentioning Heard, but otherwise incoherent. While on the witness stand, Depp alleged that Heard made him beg for medication while he experienced withdrawals. He also claimed Heard undermined his efforts to get sober. Although we may never know exactly what occurred between Heard and Depp, the presence of addiction in their marriage made for an uncomfortable third party. As an all-around actor and entertainer, Dick York exemplified what it meant to have a multidisciplinary job in the entertainment industry. He once acted in theater and film and even did radio back in the day. But York was best known to most of his fans for his role in the 1960s sitcom Bewitched. I'm a witch. That's wonderful. We'll talk about it tomorrow. York's time on the show as Darren Stevens made him famous. He starred alongside actress Elizabeth Montgomery, who played his wife, a witch, going through life using her powers in a non-magical world. Together, the pair became comedic gold. Despite having to leave the popular series and watch his part be taken over by another actor, York will always be remembered for his execution of the memorable TV character. York was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana in 1928, and his working-class parents often struggled to make ends meet. But even with this humble upbringing, York was rich in talent. While attending St. Mary of the Lake School, he would be encouraged to explore his singing abilities, and he joined a children's theater group called the Jack and Jill Players. There, York trained to become a child actor. The aspiring star continually found work, specifically in radio acting in the days before TV. York worked steadily in small parts in numerous radio productions until he was 15, when he landed the starring role in his own radio network series, That Brewster Boy, but he'd soon find himself on the big screen, too. Well, gentlemen, here we are again. After studying drama at DePaul University, he made several appearances on TV shows like Kraft Television Theater and Alfred Hitchcock Presents, but he hit the big time when he was cast as Darren Stevens on Bewitched. His portrayal of the often irritated husband of a witch-turned-housewife became the role for which he'd be best loved. But during his time filming episodes of the show, York was silently suffering from a condition that would become a catalyst in derailing his career. A few years earlier, York had injured himself on the set of the movie They Came to Cordura. He was lifting a railroad hand car with other cast members, but when the director called cut, everyone stopped lifting except for York, which of course injured his back. I really was scared in that fight, that's why I bit my chin strap through. He tried to recover using painkillers and other medications. He continued to act on Bewitched, and as things got worse for him, the show apparently adapted. According to IMDb, the set was equipped with special furniture to accommodate his injury. But after taking drugs year after year to try to deal with his pain, York had become addicted. He became so dependent on the drugs that even though he had avoided taking them before heading to work, it soon spilled into his professional life and he started medicating on set. By 1969, the show could no longer work around his health issues, and when York passed out on set that year, he was let go. His beloved character was taken over by actor Dick Sargent, and the show went on without him until it went off the air in 1972. A year before the show wrapped, York had weaned himself off the drugs that cost him his career. He returned to acting in the 80s, but found very few roles, and eventually just stopped acting altogether. According to the Los Angeles Times, in 1989, York was living in Michigan, suffering from emphysema, dependent on oxygen, and nearly destitute. He and his wife were reportedly living off his $650 monthly pension from the Screen Actors Guild. But the actor was using his final days to help out the most vulnerable. York created a charity called Acting for Life and became dedicated to helping the homeless. I don't know, well, maybe I'm expecting too much. Maybe I'm looking for magic. He died at the age of 63 in 1992 from emphysema. York had been a lifelong chain smoker with a multiple pack-a-day habit. Despite having defeated one life-threatening addiction, decades of smoking took their inevitable toll. York died on February 20, 1992. He was survived by his wife, Joan Alt, and their five children.